Hello, everyone. I think we are live. If someone can me a, if if someone can send me a, a nice comment telling that everything is fine, that would be appreciated. I know there's some delay. Okay. I think someone sees me. Okay, it's 10 p.m. at my location, which is Poland. So I guess we can begin. Okay. If there's any problems, just let me know and we will try to do the best. So uh, the topic of today's um, talk is multi in Rails and in particular PostgreSQL schemas. Uh, I would like to cover um, how it works, uh, when, when to choose it, the pros and cons, and what are specific pitfalls and caveats, nuances that we have to deal with. Okay. Um, a word about me. Um, I, um, my name is Tomek and I work for Arkansas and I had a chance to work on two uh, multi-tenant projects um, recently. And uh, we had different approaches in both of them and yeah, that makes a lot of Mm, good stories to talk about here. Okay, let's define multi-tenancy. I, I know this, this is a boring way to start a lecture, but let's do it. Uh, I would say this means serving uh, multiple independent customers from one application. For, for example, an e-commerce platform host, hosting many shops like Shopify. That's that's a multi-tenant application uh, for me and I guess for you too. Mm. One could ask, if, is GitHub a, a multi-tenant application? What's your, what's your opinion? It's a classic application because they interact with each other. I suppose in, in a classical multi-tenant application, the the tenants are isolated, just like you can see on the image here where you could say there's a tenant in each window. Okay. Okay, so if, if you see this apartment building, let's say this is a multi-tenant application, then would you say this st stadium is a single tenant application? I tried to uh, yeah, have an adequate image for that, and I would say the, stadi the stadium can, can represent like an application like, a f like a Facebook or another social media platform. The apartment building is, of course, uh, a multi-tenant application. Then what, what could we represent by this nice suburb here? If you get someone's post, okay. The story of Project A, uh, which I personally worked on. So the Project A, uh, it was an inherited project. Um, it was quite quite messy. And it was an actual multi tenant application where tenants didn't have to do at all with each other. And it was implemented via row level multi tenancy, which is, I would say, the conventional way to do it. Uh, row level multi tenancy is like the simple solution where each table gets a tenant ID column. Simple, yeah. Actually, almost each because the associated tables don't really need to have that tenant ID column. And 
you do your stuff just by uh, appending where tenant ID equals X clauses in all your queries and all your rights and so on. So we had uh, such a project and one day we asked uh, what's the biggest risk? What's the worst thing that can happen um, with that project? And we, since that was serious accounting application, the biggest risk we concluded is a data leak. Actually, it wouldn't even be so bad if we if we had uh, some calculations gotten wrong, because we can always correct that later, but a data leak, that would mean a disaster. And actually, I even had Google Docs leak a document for me once. I actually got someone else's uh, CRM uh, spreadsheet with a lot of people's data just suddenly appear on my, on my drive. That was interesting. And I suppose if that can happen on Google, then uh, yeah, I would say no one is safe. So on that project A, we actually dreamed of a better isolation. And not only because of isolation reasons, also we, we often did um, operations like extracting tenants' data, replicating, cloning tenants. And that was all really cumbersome with the row level multi-tenancy. Actually, I, I no longer work on that project and I, had a chance to join another project, which was an existing single tenant code base with many separate instances running. So it was kind of, one could say, uh, like that su suburb on that image where there were separate instances, completely, uh, completely separate race applications with completely separate databases. So, uh, and one day we needed to create a multi-tenant instance. So where one race application would actually handle a couple tenants. And the important thing was that uh, there were not so many tenants. And we wondered like whether to go for row level approach for, or for schema level approach. We actually settled with, with schema level approach, which brings me to the stock. So let's uh, let's have a couple words about what schema level multi-tenancy is, because not everyone not everyone may be aware of that. So PostgreSQL has this feature called schemas. The the name is a little bit misleading. Actually, that would that should be called namespaces. This is a PostgreSQL schema is like a collection of tables inside your database. So one could say like a database inside a database, but basically it's just a collection of tables, something that, that you could easily mm, simulate by manually prefixing table names with some tenant one prefix. Okay, this is called schema. Uh, actually, internally, it's, it's sometimes even called a namespace. And then um, you've got the search path. This is just a variable in, a, in PostgreSQL connection. And you set it to a certain value, like tenant1. And basically, on this variable, PostgreSQL queries the tables from the specific schema, from the specific namespace. That's just about it. Uh, one needs to know that the search path is scoped to the PostgreSQL session, which is the Postgres PostgreSQL connection. And then we need to know how Rails connections map to it. Yes, yeah, so we got Rails connection pool and each one is uh, actually uh, a separate PostgreSQL 
connection. That's by default, there can be different setups which we're gonna get to later. Okay, so let's say you have to implement uh, multi-tenancy. So uh, what does a Rails developer do before he starts implementing a new feature? That's a question. If you have, a, have an idea, just let me know in the comments. I wonder what is the lag currently. Okay, what does the Rails developer do before he starts implementing a new feature? Of course, you Google for the GAN that would do the job for you. Uh, if you Google multi tenancy jam, you, you 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 quickly find some solutions. Uh, the most popular one to do it is the apartment GAN. Uh, I won't cover the GAN a lot here in this talk because uh, actually it's not that much interesting. Uh, the, the the functionality is quite trivial. Uh, basically, you just need to somehow switch the tenant and, and manage running the migrations on on the on all the schemas. So I won't I won't uh, get too much into detail with apartment. Um, the, the 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 important thing is that um, the status of this gem is kind of complicated. Uh, I'll I'll uh, get to that later. Uh, another important thing is that it supports many strategies. So one of them is PostgreSQL schemas. It also can do a similar thing with MySQL. I don't think it's a nice um, way. I prefer, I would prefer a more opinionated approach like Sidekick does. Um, I, I think that could be more uh beneficial for maintainers okay but let's just see briefly how it works um, <clears throat> this is the main method in apartment uh, that switches the tenant this happens in this happens inside the request if there's a web request coming uh, and and then, then there's the middleware. Uh, it switches to the current tenant, and you can see the line uh, where it changes the schema search path. Okay, let's see what it does inside Active, active Records. This is basically a, a setter which does something, something under the hood. Interesting magic. Uh, it executes a, a, a SQL statement which sets the search path to to the to the schema. So you can you can also see the uh, the uh, the comment saying that this should not be called manually but set in the database YML. So uh, the basic functionality, and we can already see that we are kind of abusing the. The, the, the functionality a little bit. Okay, but maybe it works. Okay, let's compare uh, some of the approaches to multi-tenancy. Let's take the row level that I talked before at the beginning where you just have the tenant ID column in each of your tables and you up and where closes to your queries. Then you have the schema level where each tenant has its own set of namespaced tables in shape of a PostgreSQL schema. And let's say a DB level, which is, I would say, really uh, practical, but for the sake of comparison, well, let's keep it there. Where in, in the DB, le DB level, each customer which would, would, would have a, its own database. Okay, there's a couple a mm, couple uh, aspects to com compare. Let's say, let's start with tenant setup. Uh, 
by which I mean the speed and the operation operation overhead. So in row level, it's like lightning fast. Uh, uh, you just you just set a variable inside your request. In schema level, you actually need to make a you actually need to make the SQL call to search to set the search path, but this is still fast. In the DB, le DB level, you actually would need to spin to spin spin off another DB connection. So that could be that could be slow. That would be different in case of MySQL, but in case of PostgreSQL, you would need to spin uh, spin off another DB connection. Okay, leaking data between ten tenants. So in level, you forget to happen to equals current tenant. Uh, you're basically screwed. Uh, I know there are solutions to deal with that in a systematic level, like um, I guess access tenant gen. I didn't try it. Uh, I know it works uh, via the default scope feature. Um, I I done. I, I'm not really going into that because the, in the in the project I worked on, we actually. It was done manually. It was the way we inherited it uh, from the previous team, and uh, and there, yeah, there were other priorities, and we didn't have uh, time to change it. Uh, and I guess there are a lot of projects in the wild which do this kind of thing manually, and you just need to have enough discipline uh, to to to. Yeah, to pay attention to, to don't forget that. In the schema level, uh, leaking data is a lot less uh, likely, but still there might be some situations which you need to care about, which I will mention later. On the DB level, let's say you're the most safe when it comes to leaking data. And now let's have an image. Um, Maybe there's some friends from the Eastern countries which will immediately know what's on the left side on the, of, this, of this screen. Uh, this is a sleeping compartment in a train. Uh, the one on the right has separate rooms um, for, for each uh, group of passengers. And the one on the left is like, Everyone sleeps in basically one space. Yeah, so I, I had the chance to travel with 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 such train, and that's like a really nice experience when you can where you can socialize with a lot of people for the whatever the number of days you travel. Uh, and one could say this depicts the difference between the row level approach and schema level approach when it comes to data isolation. Okay, invasiveness. I mean, how the approach affects the way you, your code base and database looks. So row level is just, let's say, plain Rails. On schema level, uh, I think I, I got the icons here wrong. wrong. On row level, row level, you basically have the columns, tenant ID columns everywhere. Um, and uh, Mm, the closest everywhere, so that's that's uh, that might be a, a um, noise to look at. On schema level, one could say the the um, the code base is not that much affected. You just need to take care of some things on the uh, systemic level. On the DB level, I would say it's even similar. Uh, Shared tables. Okay. Mm. By shared tables, I mean, <coughs> I think I again got these icons wrong, so don't pay attention to them. Uh, 
The question to ask is whether you need shared tables and whether you need to merge data across tenants. If you do, then row level is the safest approach. In schema level, you still can do it, but it's, let's say, less conventional. And on the, D, on the DB level, you can only do it in app. Uh, you cannot do it in SQL. DB migrations. Uh, now the icons are right. Uh, on the row level, it's basically very quick. Uh, I mean, normally, um, it's just normal. Uh, on the schema level, it's slower because you have to run the migration separately for each for each tenant for each schema. On the on the DB level, one could say it's even it's even slower because you have to con you have to connect to 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 each DB. Uh, conventionality. Uh, so, how does the approach uh, adhere to framework assumptions? We know uh, Rails has a lot of assumptions and opinions, uh, and row level is just classic Rails, no problems expected. But schema level is sometimes at odds with Rails assumptions, which I will I, I will hope I will get to. I, I hope I hope I will. I hope I will get to, the, to this later. Additional costs. Mm. So the thing to take into account here is to is the DB level, where you could have additional pricing for uh, for every uh, database, but that that might not be the case. Uh, operations overhead. Uh, do you have to do some occasional special operations? Uh, and um, yeah, I would say with the DB level, yes. With the schema level, also sometimes because you have you basically have uh, a new set of tables for each tenant. Uh, this might influence uh, such operations like backups. It, they may they might take longer uh, when you're on schema level level approach, and with with row level everything would be just as expected. Complexity. Uh, so with row level you've got the tenant ID columns everywhere. On schema level the complexity lies in the uh, in the fact that it's a little bit exotic feature uh, and. Uh, sometimes you might have um, some problems that are not so conventional. Uh, we'll get to that later. Okay, where is the approach possible? So, row level is basically possible everywhere. It's just a classic approach to uh, to database design. But schema level and DB level, uh, you need to be careful and uh, check whether you can do it uh, on your DB setup, especially if you're on some cloud-hosted DB or on a managed DB. Can you perform all the operations like creating schemas uh, or creating databases? That's the stuff worth checking. Okay, switching tenants. I mean the cost to switch to another tenant inside the request. So with the role of just change a variable schema level you need to you need to uh, run the query which just sets the search path inside the postgres session and db level yeah that might be that might need to uh, create another db connection okay extracting data this is something we often needed to do on the first project because we needed to clone a tenant, replicate it for testing purposes. And this was really cumbersome with the row level approach. With schema level, it was just no brainer. And just like with DB level. OK, so just to sum up this section, which approach to take? Uh, if you have a lot of tenants, I would say definitely row level, because at some point, the, the time to run migrations can uh, be too long. If that's the case, you can still you can still kind of shard your 
uh, schemas and let's say run a couple separate uh, application instances with separate DBs with a couple with some number of schemas in each. Uh, so that's just a, uh, just an alternative idea. Uh, if you have a lot of low value tenants, then uh, also consider row level, um, especially if it's like free accounts or abandoned accounts, because every tenant uh, costs you another set of tables. Uh, if, if, if this is a paying customer and, and you have like a specific value for it, then you can go with schema level. Um, okay, if you're anxious about data isolation, consider schema level. Uh, if you need some more data isolation for legal reasons, then even DB level might be the case because the, the company might not be fine with their data living in the same database as other customers. Are you on a managed database? Double check if you can do schema level because that might not just be possible. If you are turning an, an existing single tenant code base to a multi-tenant application, schema level might be easier to introduce because it just requires some some uh, code on the systemic level. Uh, Greenfield project, yeah, it's easier to introduce row level approach uh, on a Greenfield project. If you need to combine a lot of data across tenants, schema, schema level is possible, but row level is a safer bet. Okay, let's get to the pitfalls and caveats and other nuances of schema level approach because uh, it all sounded simple, like just install the game and be happy. Uh, but things are complicated if you go deeper. Okay. Uh, the state of apartment GAN. Mm, as I said, it's quite popular, but currently it seems to be un, unmaintained. Uh, there is a fork uh, which is supported, which shows that there's a lot of uh, people using that and quite determined to keep it going. Mm, race 6 is currently not supported on the existing uh, original repository, but the, the fork uh, aims to do that. Uh, actually, when we were doing that, we, we, we even considered ejecting apartment, meaning moving the code to our repository and only take the strategy which we, uh, which we used, which was the PostgreSQL schemas and, and uh, so that we wouldn't really need to care about uh, all the other strategies like my MySQL. Okay, uh, one interesting situation we had uh, with with the, which could which was actually quite uh, quite dangerous because that could lead to uh, to a data leak. Uh, even though we were on the schema level approach, which was supposed to be really well isolated. Um, on one occasion, it, it turned out that if I opened uh, one console and set the search path to a specific tenant, uh, I, could, uh, I could go to another console and see the same tenant set. I was like, my mind was boggling, but that was the, the time when I discovered that we have uh, PG Bouncer under the hood. PG Bouncer, PG Bouncer is a, a tool quite popular to uh, control the number of connections you make to your uh, PostgreSQL server. It runs in three modes, uh, one being session mode, the other uh, transaction mode uh, and, and statement uh, mode. 
In transaction mode, which was the, the recommended default in our case, um, in transaction mode, basically you cannot use any of the session features. Uh, and it can happen that uh, one request does, does two transactions and one of them is run on one connection and the other is run on another connection. And as I said before, the search path is only set for the specific connection. So using the transaction mode was a no-go uh, if we wanted to keep using search path. Um, basically, W solution was to uh, was to was to switch to session mode. But session mode basically uh, acts um, similarly to what you, what you would have without uh, without the PG bouncer. Mm, namely, you have a separate session for each request. Only the difference is that you that it's limited to a, to a certain number. But switching to session, to session mode has its own set of consequence, consequences. Meaning now you have, you have to kind of estimate the number of connections you can do, and uh, yeah, you can run out run out or, or from uh, of the resources on the DB server. So uh, session mode is the is the required uh, thing. Um, and you have to keep, uh, you have to watch to, you have to estimate the number of connections you do in one moment, like counting the the number of web processes you have and job, uh, background job processes you have. Okay, multiple threads. Uh, if you spin off another thread inside your web request, it won't have the search path set correctly. So it will work on another tenant, basically on, on the default tenant. I know this is not what you typically do uh, inside a request, but this is something we once did uh, try to do inside a uh, job, or background job worker, where you, we would spin a couple threads, uh, where we would perform some uh, calculations on DB data, and, and then you need to take care of setting uh, the search path in all the connections that the uh, that that the threads use. Okay, now multiple connections. Let's say we have a class product, um, uh, 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 typical. Active Record uh, class, and then you do establish connection inside. Uh, this is typically used to establish the connection to another DB. Uh, so why would anyone connect to the same DB inside the pro inside the product inside the class? But uh, you know, we deal with legacy software, and there's a lot of uh, crazy and weird things happening sometimes. Uh, and we actually had a situation like this once. Uh, and the, the, the outcome was that there's, there, were, there, were, there was two sets of connection. There were two connection pools uh, in the race application and you needed to set the connection in both of them. Uh, otherwise, you could also end up with mixed data. The solution is like a after switch callback. I'm aware this is not a common situation, but it might be worth knowing. Okay, the 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 previous three um, the previous three uh, situations uh, have something in common. They all um, they all stem from the fact that uh, search path is stateful and the state lives in Postgres connection. Uh, 
that's a kind of thought experiment, but uh, the first uh, the first snippet is what's what's actually uh, done in current uh, conventional solution like apartment, and the the the, the second snippet is a kind of thought experiment. What could you do to keep the state uh, inside your application instead of the instead of the uh, PostgreSQL connection, uh, where you would actually uh, go through all the uh, um, active record descendants and uh, substitute the table names um, for each of them. Uh, maybe that could be a viable approach. We didn't test that because, yeah, it's difficult to make sure you don't miss any handcrafted SQL. In an existing existing project, but maybe uh, that would uh, create a more robust solution. Okay, uh, Postgres extens extensions. Uh, a lot of people use one of them, like HStar, L3, PG Crypto. Uh, it's not a pitfall, but a caveat. Let's say mm, uh, currently extensions have to live inside a specific schema. Uh, normally they live inside the public schema, uh, which is no longer accessible if you're doing the schema-based multi-tenancy. Mm. Uh, so you basically have to move the extensions to another schema which you append to, uh, to your search path uh, all the time, regardless of what is the current tenant? Uh, tenant. Why am I say, saying that? We had a quite uh, tricky situation uh, with doing this change on our uh, DB setup. Uh, so again, it's worth checking whether you can do all the operations. Yeah, and uh, the config piece is the 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 the, the apartment config that that takes care of appending the extension schema to the search path all the time. Okay, DA job, another piece of uh, software that some people use, but not everyone, of course. It, it's used to process background jobs, background jobs, and it stores the job data in an SQL table instead of Redis or whatever. And the interesting situation is that uh, you need to decide where to put the job uh, data for a specific tenant. Do you have uh, a separate jobs table for each tenant? Then that would mean you would have a worker which uh, needs to query all these tables or have a uh, number of workers, uh, like the number you, meaning the number of tenants you have. Um, so that would be problematic. Basically what you can do, what you can do, you can, you can um, keep putting um, the jobs to a shard, to a shared table uh, and depending some, some metadata, which lets you know which tenant is that. And then the worker just queries the, uh, the single table, which brings us to the concept of shared tables. In apartment game, you can do it via config excluded models. Uh, and the functionality basically works as I, uh, as I described in the proof of concept before, it substitutes the table name, not on the fly, but this is how the concept of shared table tables works uh, in apartment. Plugging in the middleware. So uh, you switch the tenant for every uh, single request. And in case of apartment, you do it uh, via a piece of middleware. And the, the important thing is to insert it uh, above any other middleware that might contact active record or do some uh, SQL queries. Otherwise, Anything that's above won't, won't uh, take uh, current tenant into account. 
migrations per tenant versus global migra mig mig migrations. So this is not really a problem, but an interesting thing. Uh, normally you run, uh, you run the migrations uh, for each tenant. Let's say add a column, then you need to run it for every single tenant. But sometimes you might have some uh, unconventional migrations that you only want to run for the whole uh, database. Uh, this is not something that happens often, but uh, this illustrates um, that the schema approach is somehow at odds with race assumptions. And while this is not a problem and it's fixable this way or another, uh, it shows that we are going into a territory where we might sometimes uh, mm, go against the assumptions, which yeah, which might might cause some problems sometimes. Okay, some other some other things. Um, how do you write the tests? Uh, setting up a tenant is costly, so. If you have like 100 tables, obviously you won't be able to 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 have a huge suit, which would set a tenant uh, in 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 every test case. So that's worth thinking about. Uh, what is the role of public schema? This is something we will touch uh, on uh, in another slide uh, too. Um, one idea. At the beginning, I was thinking about uh, actually deleting all the tables from the public schema, uh, just in case uh, there's some uh, weird bug, uh, which would make, um, make me fall back to the public schema. I would then get an exception uh, because the, the, the code couldn't, couldn't make a, uh, query on a table that doesn't exist. Eventually, we didn't go for that because I, I suppose that could make uh, that could that could confuse rails. But maybe that's an interesting approach. Uh, MySQL DBs versus PostgreSQL schemas. So the relationship here is um, is um, complicated. Basically. MySQL DBs are similar to PostgreSQL schemas in the way that you can easily switch between them via the use statement, uh, in which case the use statement works just set search path state statement in Postgres. Uh, the difference is that you need, you need to be able to, to, to create uh, databases on the fly if you want to set up ten tenants uh, on the fly. And uh, yeah, I suppose uh, PostgreSQL setting up uh, PostgreSQL schemas uh, is still less of a hassle than to set up uh, just an, to a brand new DB. Okay, scaling. So yeah, we talked, uh, we talked about uh, this uh, already. Uh, it's not an approach that scales, yeah? If you hit a certain limit, uh, I would say you can go and uh, partition your uh, application, your system into a couple instances where each instance would host a certain set of schemas. Okay. Uh, that's about uh, it, um, we I still have uh, uh, two interesting uh, things uh, about multi tenancy to say, uh, but let me know in the comments did you learn something useful today? I will happily look at the comments section. I hope you did. Um, if you didn't, you can just look at the nice library. On the on the photo on the left on the right, and let me just discuss an interesting question: um, Where does the tenant list belong? 
so let's say you create a uh, application you create an application uh, a multi tenant application and uh, and you obviously need to store the tenant list somewhere yeah where would that be uh, for a lot of developers the like knee jerk reaction the 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 intuitive um, solution would be to just create another uh, another table tenants table yeah but now where do you put it if you put it to the um, inside the multi tenant application then you need to carry it over to all the schemas yeah i would that, whereas it's a meta data one would say yeah so uh, basically that might not be a problem to just have it in the public schema and have an empty table uh, have an empty table in the other schemas but it shows an interesting uh, observation that the tenant management is basically another application logically it doesn't really fit to the multi-tenant application even though i would say 90 percent uh 90 percent of the of the um, race developers would just create the table uh, and the thinking about the separation of applications separation of uh separation of um concerns brings me to another interesting questions uh, namely the story of the tenants table uh, even though the tenants table wasn't logically the piece of the multi tenant application we actually put it uh, put it uh, to the public schema because that was what the what the what our client wanted for the time being and it was funny what it was uh, funny what happened next, uh, namely, uh, at first the tenants table had only one responsibility: to map the uh, URL domains to PostgreSQL schemas, so that a certain URL would be mapped to uh, to the specific uh, schema, and. We, we would know which domains to reject and so on. Uh, then another functionality came up. Uh, the, the client wanted uh, to have a sign up page where, uh, where a, a user could request, uh, re request to create a tenant instance. He would basically uh, visit the page and uh, fill the domain domain that he wants and uh, enter his email saying that I want to to have a uh, to have account on your on your platform and again the our client insisted that we put this to the tenants table this was the point at which I started thinking like something is, is wrong here because this is logically uh, two different things. One is the um, how we map domains to schemas, how we uh, which tenants do we let in, and then it's a different thing to 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 to, to know the the like prospective tenants or the users who sign up for for having a an account or on our platform uh, but again the intuitive rails developers uh, solution was to put it all to the single tenants table and then uh, we needed to make sure uh, user cannot pick a certain domain on the sign up page because let's say we got the www domain or some other reserved domains and again, uh, to make the validations fast, the race developer would put the data to the same table. 
and that brings me uh, that brings me to uh, something I wanna uh, tell about uh, soon, which is the bounded context. This is a topic from BDD, and this is something that really changed the way I think about uh, design. Normally, a Rails developer just thinks about a single model. And of course, you got a single tenant stable, and everything thing has to go there. And you end up with a lot of callbacks, a lot of conditional validations, and so on and so on. Whereas, uh, sometimes you just need to uh, you just need to notice there's a couple separate there's a couple separate concepts. And actually, in this case, I would go I would go to for three separate tables: one mapping the domains, the other tenant signups, and the third the reserved domains. It sounds like the application, but if you think in terms of bounded contexts, bounded contexts, that's, that's a difficult word, uh, it all makes sense. Uh, I can guarantee once you uh, get the grips of, uh, the, of the idea of bounded contexts, you, you will never look at uh, designing uh, the same. I couldn't sell that idea to the customer, he insisted on the single tenants uh, table because that's that's how we're uh, how we're taught to think in railway model, and that's it. Models associations. Uh, whereas this 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 often doesn't really represent the reality, and then you end up with weird stuff like callbacks, uh, conditional validations, and all sorts of different bugs. So. That's that's how I wanna bring you to uh, to the uh, pitch about Rails Architects Masterclass, which is uh, which is something uh, uh, we do now. We're opening the fourth edition. Uh, this is a course, a video course, where uh, we try to teach you basically everything we know. Uh, about Rails architecture, DDD, uh, secure as uh, it's like a accumulation of the most valuable uh, pieces of knowledge. Uh, how to make your systems modular and yeah, not so messy like on the left side, but with nice uh, boundaries. Uh, I have to say. Uh, when I first, uh, when I first kind of uh, met this body of knowledge, like DDD, bounded contacts, events, uh, the 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 it was like a kind of epiphany. Uh, some concepts are so uh, life changing that you never uh, you can't really think in the traditional terms again. Um, <clears throat> Rails Architect Masterclass, uh, that's uh, how we call it. Who is it for? It's for Rails developers. Um, yeah, these are the topics present in other, in other uh, communities, uh, but uh, in, in the Rails community, not a lot of people do it. Uh, the 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 course is, I would say, for developers with some experience. I wouldn't say it's uh, I wouldn't say it's suitable for like if you have like one or two years of experience, uh, because it's only after some time you start noticing the problems that the DDD uh, and other approaches uh, fix. And uh, what what is covered? Even driven architectures, uh, DDD, CQRS, even sourcing, uh, front end integration patterns, microservices patterns, uh, advanced uh, advanced testing. Uh, this and uh, a lot more 
I could say that uh, even a single idea from this set of topics can uh, change the way you think about designing systems. Let's say uh, the idea of, of an event. I, 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 I didn't know such thing exists some time ago. And on the system I worked on, uh, basically it begged for a thing like that in a lot of places. And we, yeah, we suffered uh, f the consequences of not having this kind of uh, concept in inside our database. When it comes to bounded context, which is, uh, which is uh, a way to split your application uh, vertically, as opposed to horizontally into layers, uh, this, is some, this is also something which can, which can uh, completely change the way you think about applications. So, uh, what I mean, even if you take this course and only, only grasp a, one idea, that could be still beneficial uh, for your thinking about systems and designing them. What gets inside? Uh, the video class, that's the most popular format uh, of education these days. You get uh, the access to a Slack community. We are there, uh, happy to answer your questions. You get a book, DDD on Rails, uh, a nice piece, uh, which, yeah, again, tells a lot of what's inside the video class. You get the audio version, mobile version, you get the homeworks. And uh, there's the live calls uh, where we, where the attendees jump on the call and we, we can uh, discuss. Also, um, okay, here's, let's look at the modules. The first four modules are crucial. Uh, that's the most important stuff. Mm. The first module is the introduction, then uh, the second strategic DDD, uh, then the third tactical DDD and patterns. So strategical DDD, uh, okay. Yeah. And then backend architecture. Here's a couple uh, slides from, from the video course. Domain Safari as a way of uh, getting to know your domain, even though even though you don't have the access to the domain experts. Uh, CQRS done by Murek. Mm, and process managers. So these ideas, uh, each of them alone is like uh, <laughs> worth us a uh, worth of. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> a month of salary, uh, because uh, how often did you, uh, did you spend a, a week fixing a, 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 a weird bug that shouldn't have occurred in the first place? Okay, I'm getting to the end. Uh, Race Architect Masterclass. If you join today, there will be one module available. On Friday, you will get access to the second module, then uh, the rest. And after the first four modules, uh, we can already jump on a quick call and answer your specific questions. The thing is that the, the, the first four modules are uh, really important uh, and probably uh, a lot of your questions might be answered there. Uh, but after that, then, then uh, a lot of things we can work out on, on, uh, on a quick call. Yeah, now the price. Uh, 800 bucks. I would say uh, that's like one quarter of a average salary, at least here in, uh, in, uh, in Poland. Uh, but I would think 
is it worth it? Let's say, uh, try to think how, how much time uh, you, you spend fixing problems you that should never have happened in the first place. This is the this is the page where you can get it. There's a link in the description. And uh, important thing, the sale is open only uh, during the conference week, uh, which means it's it closes on 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 Monday the next week. So uh, so yeah, uh, make up your mind and. Uh, uh, I hope you enroll. And now it's perfectly one hour in. We can jump to the Q and A section. I'm looking at the at the uh, comment section. Okay. No short time. Stream Buddha today. Stream Buddha today. <laughs> okay. Greetings from the friends from from Ukraine. Ukraine, lovely country. Hi. I expect uh, great information. I hope you did. Let me know what did you like. Uh, greetings, everyone. Hi, Sun Kanmi. Nice to meet you. Hi, Artyom Kirienko. Mm. Hi, Alexander. So far, I tried. Hi, Sebastian. So far, I tried separate tables for different namespaces and different databases, but that was. Uh, but that was not production application. The multiple schemas within, within single DB is new thing for me. Uh, happy to be able to show something new. Hi, Marco Tuzo. Nice to see you. Uh, hi, Lodevicus. I have tested all three ways and decided to use single DB schema in my e-commerce project. Um, okay, yeah, that makes sense a lot of cases. Hi, Emily. Nice to see you here. Uh, hi, Nicolas. Hi, Dimitri. Hi, Shimon. That's my friend Shimon. Good to see you. Uh, let's rock and roll. I hope we did. Oh, I can see we're just at the start of the stream. Okay, so uh, hi everyone. <laughs> Okay, Shopify does that. Shopify does that actually. Shop ID for each column. Yeah, interesting to know. Oh. That was the answer to the question what does a Rails developer do? Uh, what does the Rails developer do when he starts from uh, starts on implementing a new feature? Looks for a gem. Yeah, <laughs> perfectly, a perfect answer. Hi, Pavel. Is there a limit of schemas you can have in Postgres? Uh, I don't know of the limit. Uh, I think uh, there is one that you will never uh, actually hit because you will be, you will be, you will first have the problems, the perf performance pro problems related to running the uh, migrations on every single schema and just from the sheer fact of having such a number of DB tables inside the DB. So I think there is a theoretical limit, but you will not hit it. Heroku also recommends uh, against using the positive schema approach and has experienced problems with even just 50 schemas. Okay, I just wanna say I'm not, 
I'm not advising against schema approach. You just need to uh, count the costs. Yeah. Uh, I would say even you can even even if you can do only 50 tables on a single database, that could still make sense in some approach. I can imagine having clients that just have 20 tenants for life, and that's just fine. Yeah. How are joins between schemas? If a back office needs to be built that crosses all customers, is it possible to join across schemas? Yes, it is. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, basically, uh, you can uh, prefix the table name with the tenant name and a dot and a table name, uh, just as I have shown uh, on the example with um, with uh, with the alternative stateless way of switching tenants and you can easily access uh, easily access the data from two schemas the problem is this is not traditional rails so you would need to craft your uh, craft your own sql query or you would need to uh, have like separate models and set the table name for them This sounds like an AR limitation, not schema approach limitation. There could be a way to prep a schema name to table name schema uh, from tenant one users that solves it. Correct? Yes, that's correct. That's that's uh, that's what I meant. You can prep and uh, prep and the table name with the tenant name and access tables from two tenants. And this is actually something you can do on MySQL. MySQL2, even though you're, uh, you have the data in two databases. Uh, at least this is what I heard. So uh, in that aspect, MySQL is also works the same. As far as I know, when you have both schemas added to the search path, you can do joins without any problems. Actually, that's interesting. What would happen if uh, if there's two uh, schemas with the same structure added to the search path? I would say they that wouldn't. Uh, you would still need to use fully qualified names, which means prepending uh, the table names with the tenant names, uh, because if there's two tenants in the search path, only the top schema will be resolved if the if the if the um, if the table name is the same. So that works basically as a path variable in bash. Yeah. Uh, and to do the joins with fully qualified names, you don't need to have them in the search path. You can do it with, without setting the search path. Uh, good point. Row query to join various tables. Sun Kami. Yes, I suppose that's the question if you learned something. I'm happy you did. Uh, Fire Dragon 2. Okay, nice to know you. Appreciate, uh, appreciate you, you enjoyed the comparison. Pavel, uh, yes, I actually never thought about sch using schemas for that. Nice to know. Thanks, thanks for your comment. Shouldn't it code in the public schema? I am not sure I have understood your question. Ah, that was pertaining to the tenant uh, tenants table. Yeah. That's what we ended up with. We we have put it. Uh, we have put uh, the tenants table to the public schema, but then the consequences. We have the same structure. Uh, the, the same DB structure in the public schema, and in the tenants schemas, which means you have the tenants table 
uh, an empty an empty one in each tenant schema, which is kind of weird. It's not a, like a urgent problem, but this shows you something that logically it's a different application. Thanks for sharing. Nice to know you enjoyed it. Thanks for your comment. Well, the sign-up process could have been an entirely different software, which output could have been to put something in the mapping domains to schemas. Exactly. This is basically a different, uh, a different logical component. And uh, you have mentioned the output of the sign-up process uh, would cause to put something in the mapping. And this is where events fit. Events, uh, events are the means of communication between those uh, between those uh, departments, between those bounded contents. So uh, your sign-up process would emit an event, which the mapping domain would listen to. And when it receives the event, it would create a, a, an entry in, in its own table. So there would be uh, separate tables and one would be populated upon receiving the event. Okay, here's the, here's the link to the race architects course, which I recommend a lot. Is schema level approach not doable with managed databases? Uh, it is doable, but, but might not be. It all depends on the specific environment. We did that on uh, managed DB on digital ocean. It's like a actual managed DB and it worked just uh, fine in the end, but there was some uh, setup problems, yeah? Uh, so obviously it's not a problem if you totally control the DB server, uh, but still on managed DBs, you can do it. You just need to double check. It might not be possible or there might be some other restrictions. I believe that's the end of the comments section. Uh, okay, I think that's it. So. Thanks a lot again for attending the talk. Uh, really glad to see you all here. And uh, yeah, next talk is tomorrow. Uh, Shimon Fiedler will talk about painless rails upgrades. Uh, keep an eye on, on the email. We will keep sending you updates and uh, valuable content. And yeah, stay in touch. Thanks for your time. I hope I hope this was valuable. You can comment in the section. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.